All right, welcome Soundies to our Sound for video session. It's great to have you here today. And I'm excited to talk a little bit about 32-bit float audio. We also have some questions that were submitted ahead of time. So um, I've already covered our agenda. So let's, just, <laughs> I guess we'll just go ahead and jump in. Hope everyone's staying warm for those in the Northern Hemisphere and for those in the Southern that you're staying cool. So, all right, uh, I wanna jump right on into 32-bit float audio and talk about what it is and how it works and when it's a useful tool and when it may not be quite as useful. So just, um, I think a lot of people don't really understand how this works. And I think I have a, a little bit of a misunderstanding about its value and when it works best. So what is all this noise? So first of all, there's definitely some benefits. And the, and the kind of the biggest thing is that for digital audio, usually when your audio, depending on how you have the gain set, if it gets, if it pushes up against zero dB, it starts to clip and distort. And it sounds really, really awful. And we'll actually have a sample of that a little bit later. Um, the way this works is that you can recover things that go beyond zero dB in post. So with 32-bit float, at least with the way it's implemented on most of these devices we're gonna be talking about today, you can actually go and pull that down. We'll demonstrate that in just a little bit here. You can also boost it in post without uh, raising the noise floor quite as much as if you're using a 16-bit or a 24-bit recording. So, so there's some benefits there too with the very, very quiet sounds that are captured with a 32-bit float audio recording. All right, so first, what is 32-bit float audio? First of all, I think it's important to understand that we have audio that can be, let's say, for example, we're talking about WAV files. You can record a WAV file in 16-bit, specifically that's integer, 24-bit integer, 32-bit integer, 32-bit float, um, and perhaps others beyond that as well, but we're going to talk about those today. So what we're talking about when we talk about that bit, bit depth, or what is actually sometimes called word length, is really the resolution of the amplitude. So we're talking about loudness, we're talking about amplitude of our waveform, and we're talking about dynamics. We're not talking about differences in terms of um, what frequencies can be recorded, really, really low frequencies versus really, really high frequencies. We're not talking about that. This is all about the t how tall the amplitude is on the waveform. And again, remember that audio, basically what sound is, is it's when the particles of air get uh, agitated and start moving back and forth. That's, we perceive that as sound. And so if you have something that's going up and down very quickly, that's a higher pitched sound. More slowly, that's gonna be a lower pitched sound, more of a bass type of thing, and then how much it's moving up and down, how much it's being displaced is the loudness or the amplitude. So that's really what 32-bit 30 30 float does. It, it is able to record with more resolution and able to represent a much wider dynamic range. So just for comparison, let's talk about each of these different formats. So 16-bit integer wave files can store uh, resolution information at 65,536 different values. So that's a lot of values. And with that, it can represent a dynamic range of 96.3 decibels. So actually for most uh, spoken word audio, certainly, and actually most music, you know, as a final delivery format, 16-bit is actually just fine. And in fact, that's what CDs are based on. And um, so... That's, that's just fine. It's when you get into capture, when you're recording sound, that sometimes you want more dynamic range than that. 24-bit, which is really pretty much the standard in most cinema sound right now in terms of capture, still is mostly being captured in 24-bit. That can represent 16.7 million, almost 16.8 million different values, so a lot more resolution. And with that, it can represent a dynamic range of up to 144.5 decibels. So it can represent a wider dynamic range. Um, Danny asks if we're live. Let's check. Yeah, we're live. Excellent. <laughs> Just making sure since we had that little snafu last week. All right. Um, so that's what 24-bit can do. Now, again, that's more than you generally need for spoken word, but sometimes, you know, things happen. Um, sometimes people get louder than expected, so it's Sometimes it's better to be able to leave a little bit more headroom so that you don't get that clipping distortion, which you can't. You can resynthesize it in post, but you can't really fix it. 
um, to you know to the exact original audio. So that's one of the things with 24-bit files. And, and actually, a lot of the professional grade um, recorders still have limiters and even compressors. So they do some dynamic range management while they're recording. They're actually capturing some of those peaks and pulling them down a little bit so that they don't clip going into the 24-bit converters. So there's definitely some things going on there. 32-bit floating point, on the other hand, is not an integer format. It's a floating point format. So thinking back to your math classes, um, think of it in terms of scientific notation. So 32-bit floating point can represent values from 3.4 times 10 to the 38th up to or uh, to 1.2 times 10 to the 38th. And don't worry if that if you if you've forgotten exactly how that all works. What that means in practical terms is that with 32-bit float audio recording or encoding, you can represent a dynamic range of 1528 decibels. Now to compare that, 16-bit <laughs> integer is 96 decibels, 24-bit is 144 decibels, 32-bit float is 1528 decibels. Now let's tr let's represent that visually for you Danny if you wouldn't mind switching over to the Mac here really quickly. I'm referring here to a um, this is a document or a, an article by Sound Devices. I've actually linked there are three articles in fact. I've linked all of these down in the description so you can go back and take a closer look at them. But if you wanted to see visually how that's different over here on the left in fact let me see can I make it a little bigger? Um, I can make it a little bigger, but I'm going to have to go back out at some point. So 16-bit WAV files here, again, 96 dB full scale. Note here that it represents, they can, they can represent 96 decibels. However, note that they top out at 0 dB. Same with 24-bit, it can represent more dynamic range, 144 decibels. Um, but again, tops out at 0 dB versus 32-bit float can go plus 770 dB full scale all the way down to minus... 758 dB full scale. So it's, um, in terms of just the difference between them, it's a massive, massive difference. Okay, back over to our keynote here. All right, let's talk a little bit about how things work in a digital signal chain. So here on the left-hand side, of course, we have our microphone. So this is an analog device over here, and this captures the, that movement of the sound particles or the sound sorry the air particles that generate sound when they're vibrating um, and it converts it into a very weak analog microphone level signal that goes next over into the preamplifier and the preamplifier takes that weak signal and boosts it boosts its overall level amplifies it and that brings it up roughly to a line level signal now in today's world a very well designed preamplifier can, you know, generally, depending on how much money you're willing to spend and how much design effort and how much engineering has gone into it, can represent generally somewhere between, you know, a, a decent one, 120 dB, really good one, 130 dB, maybe an excellent, excellent preamplifier, maybe up to 140-ish dB of dynamic range. Um, but there are some limitations there, just, just so you're aware. And the, the thing that happens next is that line level signal that's been amplified by the preamplifier then goes into this converter, this analog to digital converter. So it's taking this analog signal and converting it into ones and zeros. And using one of these file formats we just talked about, either 16-bit wave, 24-bit uh, wave, or 32-bit float, and a uh, wave also. And obviously there's lots of other ways it can be encoded, but we're just, for our conversation here today talking about those three. So here's the trick. This analog to digital converter, um, a really good analog to digital converter today, generally can ca take an analog signal and convert it um, with about 120, maybe a little bit more decibels of dynamic range. So that's where we're getting a lot of our limitations right now. So that's that's part of the thing that's kind of interesting to me. If we think about this in in that light, and let me just talk about a, partic a particular piece of gear. So one thing that a lot of you are familiar with is the Rode Wireless Go 2. The Rode Wireless Go 2 allows you to record on the transmitters. 
And actually, when you connect one of those transmitters to your computer to download the file that it's recorded, one of the options you have is to download a 32-bit WAV file. And when that first came out, a lot of people were really excited. Oh my gosh, it's 32-bit audio on the Rode Wireless Go 2. How amazing. No clipping ever again. Well, it turns out that's not entirely true. <laughs> In fact, what happens on the Rode Wireless Go 2 is it only has a single analog to digital converter in those transmitters, and it does clip. If you get too loud, it will absolutely clip and distort. And so just because they're using a 32-bit file container doesn't mean it's necessarily capturing a wider dynamic range. It's just writing it into a really big um, file container that can hold a lot more dynamic range. And in fact, technically, I don't believe it's using 32-bit float on the Rode Wireless Go 2. It's using 32-bit integer, which cannot represent nearly as much dynamic range. Um, but that's another, another conversation for another time. So in that light, I actually find that you, that when manufacturers use this term that our recorder is capable of recording 32-bit float audio, I don't think that's a really good way to represent it because 32-bit float really only refers to the file format. It doesn't refer to this additional important piece. And let me show you what I mean here. So if I have these wide dynamic range recorders, and this is going to be things like the Mix Pre 2 series, the Zoom F6, the new Zoom F3 that just came out, the Zoom F2. Um, we also have this. Uh, this is the Tascam Porta Capture X8, which we took a look at last week, and we're going to listen to one of its audio files here today. Um, those all record in 32-bit float, but they do something interesting. Here in their analog to digital converter, remember we said that generally the best analog to digital converters today can do somewhere around 120 dB of dynamic range, maybe a little bit more. What these recorders do instead, instead of using a single analog to digital converter, they actually use multiple. And in fact, if we switch over, Danny, to the Mac here, I want to go, this is one of the articles that I linked to at Sound Devices as well. And you can see here, they've represented a signal chain here as well. Um, and they've talked about their preamplifier and then a multi-stage analog to digital converter. This is what I mean. So what they're actually doing is in this case, they are taking, and let's go ahead and switch back. They are taking, they have two converters instead of just one. So they're taking that audio out of the preamplifier and one converter, and this is, there are multiple ways they can do this. This is just one example. One of the converters can take the lower amplitude sound and convert that. And another converter can take the higher amplitude sounds and convert that, those. And that way they can actually capture much more dynamic range that way. Because now there are two converters, say for example, sharing the work of converting. And if they can each do about 120 dB of dynamic range, they can capture a much wider dynamic range when they're working together. So that's the special thing about what these new recorders are doing. And so, um, and then of course they write it into a 32-bit float file. So from my point of view, it really should be called, these should be called wide dynamic range audio or wide dynamic range recorders. Um, because they're doing something that's substantively more than just recording into a 32-bit float file. So that's just, I, I know it's maybe being a little bit nitpicky, but I think it's important because I think Rode Wireless Go 2 is a great example of where people get confused and think, oh, wow, this is amazing. This, this $300 device has a two-transmitter, single dual-channel receiver wireless system, and I can never, you know, I'll never clip audio again. And that's not really true. That's not what the wireless go to does. However, that is what, you know, things like the Porta Capture X8, the Sound Devices Mix Pre 2 series, the Zoom F6, the Zoom F3, the Zoom F2 do. Uh, Tentacle Sync Track E does it as well. So they all implement it a little bit differently, but I just wanted to make sure that um, we talk about all those things. Now, it's important to understand there are some caveats. There are some limitations to this technology. It's, it does seem magic, and we'll take a look at a file here in just a minute so you can hear how magical it really is, um, but it's not perfect. So let me just talk about some of the limitations really quickly. Um, yeah, let's go back to the presentation actually for a minute here. Let me just run through these really quickly. So we all get very excited about... 32-bit float audio, but I but I need to bring us all back down to the ground so that we're standing firmly on the ground. Um, it's important to remember that microphones and preamplifiers limit your dynamic range. So 
a microphone has a dynamic range um, specification to which it's able to represent the sound. So it's, that's going to especially be limited on things like lavalier microphones. So keep that in mind. So these little like tentacle sync tracky recorders and zoom F2s, by the nature of the fact that you're using lavalier microphones with those, that's going to limit your dynamic range. So even though you know, you're generally not going to clip, if you get a loud enough sound into that microphone, it could saturate the microphone and it could start dis distorting in the microphone before that signal ever even gets to the 32-bit float multiple analog to digital converter recorder. So just keep that in mind. So there have been some recorders that have gone out and said, oh, you know, this is not as amazing as I thought. <laughs> if they're going to drop a microphone down on a runway and have a fighter jet fly past it, um, maybe it can handle that, maybe it can't. You're going to probably need to be, you're going to need to care about your entire signal chain and make sure your microphone can handle that as well. Um, it's important to understand too that if you're recording or even streaming 32-bit float audio with one of these recorders, that when you, as soon as you output the audio from one of the analog outputs, it can still clip. So if you're exceeding zero dB in that recorder, when you send that out of one of the outputs, it's distorted. So because those can only take anything up to zero dB and convert it back to analog and then play that back. And so this is where 32-bit um, float may not be useful for live audio. So if you're live streaming, if you are doing any sort of other live audio, it really is not, it's not gonna do all this magic that we're gonna demonstrate here in just a minute. Another thing too is they're all implemented a little differently. So for example, on the, the Zoom products, the Zoom recorders that support 32-bit float audio, you actually don't have a gain setting when you're working in 32-bit float mode. So you can't even you, you you don't even have an option to change the the input setting the gain that that is the amplification that that preamplifier does it automatically sets that for you and it sets it at what I would call a unity well what they would call a unity gain so basically kind of optimized for that preamplifier and I think what they're trying to do is make it as easy as possible for the users there and probably optimize the use of that preamplifier and optimizing its dynamic range capabilities. On some, however, like the Mix Pre and on the Tascam Porta Capture, you can set the gain setting. And that can actually change your sound a little bit. So it's important to keep that in mind as well because you're changing the amount of amplification that preamplifier is doing and the sonic characteristics change a little bit when you are you know, using higher gain versus lower gain settings. So just another thing to keep in mind, is it a massive difference? Not necessarily, but it can still make a difference. And then some people, um, some of you may know Watson Wu. Watson is a, a sound recordist. He does a lot of sound effects recording, a lot of vehicles, uh, performance vehicles in particular, firearms, things like that. Um, I had a conversation with him, and he said that um, with some of the testing he did, he was getting some artifacting. So what has to happen is when you have multiple analog to digital converters, at some point it has to merge all that audio back together, put it into one um, one file. And so it basically has to have a crossover and that cross crossovers can be tricky. Um, and he said that he did find in some cases there were some unusual kind of, um, artifacting that was happening. So strange sounds that weren't really there in real life, but were being captured by that, by that recorder. So how often does that happen? I don't know. I've, I've found that the ones I've tested have worked pretty well, but I don't do the kind of work that Watson does. Um, so he was noticing in some cases some kind of oddness there. All right, let's hop on over to the Mac and let's give you a little demo here. I want to demonstrate the difference here between 24-bit and 32-bit float. So these were recordings that were made with the Tascam Porta Capture X8. And you can see here this first portion is horribly clipped right up against 0 dB. See all of those waveforms are chopped right off. I then dropped the gain. So this was with the gain set to plus 57. That's the max setting, max gain setting on the Porta Capture X8. And this next section, I dropped the gain down to 0 dB, and this is what it captured. And then I set the gain to 20 something. I can't remember. We'll play it back and we'll be able to hear. And this is about where I would normally record spoken word audio, dialogue audio. And that looks like that. So let's do a little, little, um, something here. I also took this file. This is a 32-bit float file. And I actually can, I saved it as a 24-bit file. So this is the 24-bit version right here. And what I'm going to do is take this first section, 
if I'm working with a 24-bit file, and I'm going to drop the gain on it. I'm going to see if I can recover those highlights. And, oop, no, they're still chopped off, you'll notice. So I'm not able to recover that in a 24-bit file. Just in case you have never experienced it before, we're going to play back this clipped audio. Um, so you might want to turn your volume down just a touch. I've already attenuated it some, so it shouldn't hurt your ears. But this is what it sounds like. Okay, we are recording now with the Tazcam Porta Capture X8, the Rode MT1, and I've input level set to, or input gain set to 57 dB of gain. Danny's wondering if that's me. Yes, that is me. It doesn't sound like me, <laughs> sound like me at all, uh, she said, but um, that's, that is exactly what clipped distorted audio sounds like. Okay. Now, let's do something else interesting. Let's take this part here that was recorded at 0 dB originally. And we'll boost that up and let's see how that sounds. The trick is, is that when you're working in 24-bit or 16-bit, normally you're going to raise the noise for quite a bit as well. There's 15 dB. Let's raise it up to about right there. Let's play that back. Okay, now we're applying 0 dB of gain. And this is where that sits. So this would be <laughs> probably where we would not normally want to sit. We have a ton of headroom, about 30 dB according to the meter that I'm seeing here. So the, the actual timbre of that sounds a little different to me. Like we were, at, we're actually pushing this codec to, or uh, I don't know if you want to call it a codec, but it's encoded audio. We're pushing it to its limits and it's starting to sound a little different. And then this is what it sounds like when I gained, like you normally would, for spoken word audio. All right, talking, talking, talking. And here's about 26 dB of gain. So normally, if I were setting the gain, this is about where I'd want to be with this microphone if I'm working up pretty close on it. And uh, let's see how that sounds. Okay. So that's the 24-bit audio. That's normally what we would experience up to this point. Let's go to our 32-bit float audio. Let's go ahead and do the same thing here. Remember how distorted this sounded right here? We will go ahead and pull this down. Oh, we're recovering all of that information. It's all still there. And let's play it back now. Here we go. Okay, we are recording now with the Tazcam Porta Capture X8, the Rode NT1, and I have the input level set to, or the input gain set to 57 dB of gain. And this is what it sounds like. I'm right up on the microphone. And the idea here is to test whether the 32-bit float uh, recording capability with multiple presumably multiple analog to digital converters is able to capture this without technically clipping okay so pretty good there another benefit of 32-bit float audio is you can boost these really low levels and they'll still be pretty clean you'll you will raise the noise floor but not nearly as much as you would with a 24-bit file or with a um, even as or a 16-bit file. So let's go ahead and boost this and up. And you're using a recording device that has the multiple converters. So this is also on the Tascam. It also has, the, it does have the wide dynamic range recording capabilities. This is what it sounds like now. Okay, now we're applying zero dB of gain, and this is where that sits. So this would be <laughs> probably where we would not normally want to sit. We have a ton of headroom, about 30 dB according to the meter that I'm seeing here. So I'm going to go ahead and bump up the gain now. Okay. And then here is the other sample recorded at plus 20 some dB of gain. All right. Talking, talking, talking. And here's about 26 dB of gain. So normally if I were setting the gain, this is about where I'd want to be with this microphone if I'm working up pretty close on it. And uh, let's see how that sounds. Okay. So I hope you see that's that's the magic of 32-bit float audio recording with odd, just simple spoken word samples. Now, obviously, when you're doing where I think that 32-bit float audio is more more valuable, really, is that when you get into situations where you're recording sound effects and where you do have a massive, massive dynamic range and you don't really have the opportunity to quickly change your gain setting. So... That's a look at that. Let's go ahead and switch on back. Let's pause there for a second and let's get, are there things in the chat that we need to cover? Yeah. All right, let's go to the chat here and take a look at that. All right, first up from Christopher. 
How does the Sound Devices 8 series compare? The 8 series are not 32-bit float, wide dynamic range capable. Um, what they do, um, however, is they do have very, very good preamplifiers uh, in terms of their, they can, they're specced at being able to capture somewhere around 142 dB of dynamic range, as I understand it. Plus, they use very high quality converters, so they're going to be, you know, somewhere in the probably 130 some range. They're going to do pretty well. So, you know, you have to keep in mind that the 8 series are really. Designed primarily for, I would say, primarily for spoken word capture. They're gonna, and they do great. I, I, when I have a choice, I still use my 888 instead of my Mix Pre or any other 32-bit float capable recorder for recording spoken word audio. So, that's where I think some people get pretty excited and they're like, "Oh my gosh, 32-bit float!" Now, there there are use cases where I think it is useful for spoken word audio if you're a solo. Um, operator where you're doing camera, lighting, directing, audio, um, producing, craft services, everything else. <laughs> when you have a million things going on, some people look at the 32-bit float audio as a kind of a safety net. So if you do happen to get the gain set wrong, at least you have this sort of safety net in post that you can fall back to. Um, and I think that's valid. Um, but if you have a dedicated mixer, I think uh, by by that I mean a dedicated person focused on audio mixing, I think they can make a great recording with 24-bit and a good quality recorder. So in those cases, not necessarily, not a, not a necessity. So is the analog preamp actually the critical determination of the final quality achievable? It's abs well, anything in the signal chain is going to have an influence on the overall final quality. That is always the case, and that is still the case with 32-bit float audio. Um, so yes, uh, absolutely everything is still going to make a difference. So the, so that's why I think, for example, the, um, I think you'll find that the Zoom F2 and the, and the Tentacle Sync Track E recorders, pretty impressive for what they can do. Are they, are they going to sound as good as a really great quality boom mic on a uh, Sound Devices Mix Pre 3 2? Probably not. I would say that there's probably going to be a difference in quality there. Okay. Uh, audio buff. At our church, I sit behind the Allen & Heath D-Live. Once you hit the clip light, you still have another 20 dB headroom before distortion. Is this based on the float? No. I think in that case, those meters that you're seeing on the D-Live, my guess, I haven't used a D-Live, but most mixers, including digital mixers, mixing boards and consoles like that, is that you're actually looking at a dBU meter instead of a dB full scale meter. So it's a different thing altogether. In those cases, generally with a dBU meter, you're aiming to get the audio level somewhere around zero, um, but you still have more headroom than that. A lot of them have plus 24 dB of additional headroom beyond that. So just important to keep that in mind. So it's a very different meter. So all, all of what we've talked about up until this point is been dB full scale. That's what we're talking about here on something like a DLive. Um, or a lot of other mixers that you're going to use for live audio, usually you're going to be looking at a dB um, U meter of some sort. Uh, here is a reply from Christopher. No, the a Allen and Heath uh, based mixers have 96 bit summing paths for the buses implemented in their FPGA. Exactly right. Okay, here's a nice little summary. It's like here, four parts. Nathan says, here's how I sum up uh, most 32 bit. Question. Why does my mic not clip? Answer, because of dual gain staging in the 24-bit analog to digital converter. Question, why does my recorder not clip if I turn up levels or other processing? A, because it was stored at 32-bit float. Okay. Thanks for covering this. There is so much confusion on this, so it's great to have some clarification. Yeah, absolutely, Nathan. I, I, it, the, the thing is... It, what drove this is the million questions that I received. And a lot of people saying things like, hey, I've got a Sound Devices Mix Pre 3, the original version, but I want to upgrade to the second version. And I ask, you know, what are you recording? Talking Head. And it's just like Talking Head videos. And it's like, well, I mean, you probably don't need it, but okay. <laughs> and maybe you do, maybe you don't. I don't know. But I just, I just want people to kind of not have this money burning a hole in their pocket trying to get their hands on a sound device's mix pre 2 and I, I'm not trying to not sell mix pre 2s or sell a mix pre 2s I'm not in the, in that business but um, 
I just don't, it's just not necessary for a lot of situations. I think where 32-bit float is going to be most helpful is recording wide dynamic range sound effects. Um, and even then, again, Watson Wu, he hasn't converted, to, he has, he's not recording with 32-bit float a capable recorder or wide dynamic range recorder. He is, you know, and that, even that wide dynamic range moniker may not be the best description either because there are high quality professional grade recorders that can record what could be considered wide dynamic range. Anyway, um, I don't know what the right name is, but in any case, it's not always the answer. It's a tool. It's a valid tool. It can do some amazing things. But is it, I mean, some people just get so wrapped up and I've got to get a 32-bit float recorder. And some of them are disappointed. Once they buy it, they're like, oh, it's not that different. Like, I, I don't really use that 32-bit float feature that much. I don't clip that often because I learned how to set gain when I was re using a recorder that didn't have this feature. And anyway, now they have the latest and greatest, but it may not make a, a substantive difference. So Bartek asks, so 32-bit on a Zoom F3 isn't the same as 32-bit on a MixPre 3.2. Um, they are implemented differently. Um, you'll still see these same benefits that we demonstrated here in Adobe Audition where we boosted the levels or, or dropped the levels. You'll still see that, Bartek, but um, how they implement it is a little bit different. So, for example, on the Zoom recorder um, on an F3 coming soon, uh, the F3 doesn't have a gain shrink control when you're in 32-bit float mode. So you don't set the gain. You have a knob, and uh, at least on the F6, I don't know how it's going to be on the F3, but on the F6, you have a knob, and you can actually see the waveform change. And technically what's happening there is that it is not changing the gain. It's, it's a post-fader ISO recording. So you're actually changing the fader level, and it's just digitally boosting it. It's not changing the analog preamplifier's amplification setting. It's changing it in the digital domain after it's already been converted over to 32-bit float. So that's a little bit different. On the MixPre 3 or the MixPre 2 series, when you change gain, you're actually changing that analog stage. That analog preamplifier is actually boosting more or not boosting, depending on where you set the gain. So that's how it's implemented differently. And it looks like, I'm not 100% sure, but it looks like on the Tascam Porta Capture X8, same thing. You can still set the, the analog gain before it ever gets converted to 32-bit float. So we have a couple quick comments about the audio sample. Okay, a couple comments. All nice and well, but just looking at the spikes on waveform, wouldn't you be forced to apply more compression before delivering? I'm so glad you brought that up. It's a great question. And the answer is yes, you're just pushing the dynamics control to post-production. That's all you're doing. Um, <laughs> Because the reality, this is another question I got. Somebody who was recording uh, sports vehicles, sports cars mainly, and they wanted to get these amazing, you know, recordings of the of the muffler sound, the exhaust, um, and that really guttural <laughs> sound. However, you want to represent that. And he said, I got out on thirty two bit float, and then I put it and I played it back, and I'm like, it doesn't sound that great. Well, the, the and this is actually a conversation I had with Watson Wu as well. Is he, he said. If you to get to the final effect that you want to hear in the film or the video, you're almost always doing some pretty heavy compression on these things, both firearms and vehicles. You're really trying to get that sound that we're used to hearing, that really, really uh, powerful sound. And to do that, you're generally going to have to apply a bunch of compression. So yes, to your point, to your question here, you are going to have to make decisions in post. And <clears throat> retaining all that dynamic range is usually not the decision that people want. It's not the final result that most people want. It's just giving you that option to do it in post as opposed to during the recording itself. So great question. Not all those samples sounded nearly as good as the other demonstrations I've heard, including by Curtis. Interesting. That was on the Tascam. The other ones I've done have been on the Zoom and the sound devices and the tentacle tracky recorders. So... Darren, voiceover for animations, um, would 32-bit without a limiter be recommended over 24-bit with a limiter? Uh, I, I wouldn't, generally, no. I would just, uh, I'd get a good, I don't know if you're using an audio interface or a recorder, but I'd just get a good recorder, and I would probably go 24-bit. Put a limiter on for safety, leave enough headroom. I mean, unless you're going, I mean, 
here's the thing. Do you want to do, do you want to make these decisions in post or you want to do it while you're recording? Um, that's, I think, to a large extent where it comes, where, what it comes down to. And this is a longstanding, um, it's the same debate that was had when digital audio first came about is, should we use a compressor when we're recording into a digital system? And the earlier digital systems were a lot noisier. So you did have to push the levels a little bit harder. And so you did probably want to do some dynamics control and kind of get things evened out so you could push them in harder uh, or at a higher amplitude overall. Um, but nowadays, I don't think it, the, you know, with quality recorders, again, I'd have to know, Darren, what, what recorders are you talking about here or what audio interfaces? But generally, no, I would probably do 24-bit. Jonte, is there any quick way to convert a 32-bit spoken word file to 24-bit for delivery to editors that don't use 32-bit float? Just put a limiter and cut the peaks and then normalize? Well, see, that's the thing. If you record 32-bit float, you have to do that in post, whatever it is. Um, if we go back over to the Mac here, I would have to do a good bit of, of work here. So I would probably take all of this, and I first of all, you can see how asymmetric it is. This is at less than minus one on this side, and it's sitting at minus six, so it's quite asymmetric, first of all. So I'd probably want to even that up using ad uh, adaptive phase rotation, and then I'd want to apply a little bit of compression. Or I could just apply compression, but it's going to, you know, I'm using up some of my headroom to do that, so it's not necessarily ideal. Yeah, I, I, here's the thing. I wouldn't record 32-bit float if you're delivering to somebody else. That's a perfect example of where it's probably not the best if they're not capable or if they're not prepared to do 32-bit float and they're not being paid to do that dynamics processing for you. Or, or, you know, if they're on a tighter turnaround, they're going to spend X number of hours. You've paid for X number of hours and they only have that time to finish the audio. Um, you might want to have that done already. So I think those are all good considerations. And I don't, I don't have a perfect answer. I can I can say that I would probably just use a limiter in a 24-bit, uh, an analog limiter in particular. That's one of the things too with the zoom recorders. And once you go back to 24-bit, the zoom recorders, the F6 has a limiter and I presumably the F3 does too. I don't know. I have one on pre-order, but we haven't seen those yet. They don't come, they don't deliver until later. But uh, in the Mix Pre 2 series, when you drop them down into 24-bit mode, then in a Mix Pre 2 series, you have an analog limiter, which operates at the uh, analog stage, versus on the Zoom recorders, you have kind of this hybrid thing where basically they're tricking you. You set your gain, say, to 50 dB. They're actually dropping it by 10 dB without telling you. <laughs> and they convert that audio uh, through the analog to digital converter. And then if it won't clip, they'll boost it back up 10 dB. So you're actually raising the noise floor. So it's not my favorite approach. It works decently, um, but it's not my favorite approach to how they, you know, how you could really do dynamics control. I'd much rather do it the way that the Mix Pre does it. So those are some considerations there. That was my long-winded answer. Uh, roll fast. Uh, at some point, the bit depth has to be reduced to suit the final medium. For example, 16 bits on CD. This causes quantization distortion. Could you talk a bit about your experience and dithering? Um... Yes, um, there is quantization. Yeah, this is a topic that I don't, I, I don't really feel I'm expert enough to talk about it in depth. Um, but yeah, there is some, there is some conversion that has to take place to get it to their final delivery format. And yes, there are potential artifacts that can be introduced as a result of that, um, which includes some potential distortion and dithering is, is part of that process to help prevent that distortion. So you're, you know, you're further processing the audio to get there. Um, so yeah, that's another, another consideration. I'm not really Rolf prepared to go into that into detail, but it is something to keep in mind as well. So yes. And here's the last one. This is kind of related. Okay. Related here. Shoji Productions. If you use properly, Great mic and pre does 32-bit float inherently cause audio artifacts compared to 24-bit recordings. Um, with spoken word audio, I haven't heard a lot of that. Um, that's the thing where I referenced Watson Wu, who said he was hearing some artifacts with really dynamic sound sources. In particular, he was talking about performance vehicles. So um, I haven't heard a lot of that. Some people will notice it. 
Some people will not. It also depends very much on what you're recording. So technically, I think the answer is yes, but I think under a lot of, um, certainly with spoken word audio, chances of hearing that are pretty, pretty low, I think. So, okay. Is that everything for the chat for now? Okay, we're going to go into our questions. We had a number of questions submitted ahead of time. Let's jump in. Do you perhaps have any opinions on the newly announced Zoom F3 32-bit recorder yet? I'm curious about it as I'm looking to upgrade from the Zoom H5, which has some slightly noisy preamps. The primary use for this recording, for this is recording ambiances, quiet sounds destined for use as sound design sources. Number of inputs is adequate as I'm currently only using two mics and will probably keep it at two with a new recorder. I had the Mix Pre 3 Mark II and a Rode NTG5 shortlisted but just got notified that the F3 is being released. Your thoughts or opinions appreciated. Well, Will, I have one on order. I haven't put my hands on it yet. Um, If it's anything like the Zoom F6 but smaller, then all of the opinions that I've shared on the F6 will probably be pretty relevant. Um, The Zoom F6 is a great recorder. The things, there are some things I didn't love about it. the original version, its output had some issues. If you were sending the audio to a camera that only had a mic level input, I think it, it looks like they've addressed that issue. It would look like it was a hardware issue. It was not a not something they could fix in firmware. Um, in essence, what happened is you had to drop the level from the output on the F6 to get it to low enough level that the camera could take it um, without clipping. You introduced a whole bunch of noise, like a like a ridiculous amount of noise. On the newer copies of pe- that people have bought within the last few months, it seems like that doesn't appear to be the same problem. So I'm guessing that they did something to the hardware. Um, so I'm assuming that they will learn their lesson and that will not be an issue on the F3. So that's hopefully good. Um, I think for that kind of, for what you're doing, that the Zoom F3 would probably be a good fit. Um, but again, I'm not speaking from experience yet because I haven't used it. Also, one of the challenges with the sound devices Mix Pre two series right now is that I think basically they're impossible to get your hands on because of some global supply chain issues. So um, they may not even be an option <laughs> if, if if your timeline is relatively close. So that's the question um, from Will. Thanks for that, Will. David asks, an upcoming job requires that I do wireless XLR to audio transmission. The transmitter will plug into a mixer and the receiver into a camera's XLR audio input. Can you recommend a transmitter receiver pair with low latency that would work well in a ballroom where there might be interference from other wireless devices? The X5 U3 gets reasonably good grades, but there are some comments about dropouts caused by other devices in the room. Are there better wireless XLR transmitter receiver choices? Um, Yeah, I would, here's the trick. The X5, I believe, is a 2.4 gigahertz system. So the problem is if you get a ton of people in there and all have their phones on, they're all connected to Wi-Fi, there are multiple wireless access points, lots of 2.4 gigahertz activity in there, the the chances of dropouts on the X5 are going to be pretty high. So that's definitely a downside. Um, I would go with a UHF system. Now, exactly which one? You're going to need something that has most likely a line level input on the transmitter because you're getting a line level signal from the mixing board. Um, so that's going to move you up into the the more expensive systems, not the not so much the consumer systems. I think that the like if you wanted to look at the Sennheiser G4, I think the 500 series of the Sennheiser G4 can take a line level. You'll want to double check that. Um, pa- well, I wouldn't. You could look at the Sennheiser AVX. Uh, that is also, that's using a different frequency. It's not 2.4 gigahertz. I think it's 1900 megahertz. So it's, um, it, you shouldn't run into a lot of issues with with Wi-Fi interfering with that, but there are other, you know, that's what old, some of the old cordless phones I think work there. Um, anyway, that's another one to look at, but, but a lot of the others are gonna be higher end, more expensive. So you, the, the critical thing is you're gonna wanna look for something that has a transmitter that can take a line level input. If you can't find that, you could use something like a Sennheiser G4 100 series and you'd have to get an attenuator from the mixer or have the mixer, you know, whoever's operating the mixing board, attenuate the level of the mix that they're feeding to you. Basically, it's gonna have to be attenuated by probably 35 dB roughly to get it down to microphone level. So those are the considerations you wanna take into account there, David, hopefully. That's helpful for you. All right, song. 
Recently, I was helping out with our church event and ran into an interesting issue. We were using a Behringer XR18, and I ran an XLR from one of the aux outputs from the XR18 and connected it to mic one on an A10 Mini Extreme using an XLR to 3.5 millimeter TRS adapter. We were streaming using Resi, and people who were watching the stream were having some audio issues, even though I wasn't noticing any issues on my headphones. I think what happened is because I was sending a balanced signal from the XR18 into an unbalanced stereo input on the A10 Mini, then people watching the stream watched it using a mono speaker, so the balanced signals were merging without being inverted first. In this case, how would you connect a balanced output from a mixer like an XR18 to the A10 Mini? Um, I mean, it depends. Oh, so there a number of things. So first of all, I, I would I want to understand what was the issue exactly that the viewers were hearing or not hearing. <laughs> Did they just have no audio whatsoever? Um, also, where were you listening on headphones in that signal chain? Were you listening on the headphone jack on the A10 Mini? Because if you were and it sounded fine there and then it got into, and then I, you're streaming with Resi, I assume that's a software encoder. I'm not necessarily familiar with that. It could be that Resi is doing something to the sound. That's another thing to consider. Um, one thing I would recommend doing is um, if you have the link to the video, if it's still online somewhere, if you want to send that over to me, I'm happy to take a listen to that and see if maybe that could tell us something else as well. Um, but I would always listen to things as far, as close to the end of the signal chain as possible. And that's tough with software encoders because there's no way often to listen to them um, because it's on a computer at that point and they just send the encoded, you know, the encoded stream out to whatever service, YouTube or whatever you're sending it to. So it's really hard to tell. But what you're what you're talking about could be an issue. Let me just show you something here in the ATEM software control. So if we switch over to the Mac here. Um, what you can do is you can come into the audio settings. So again, uh, let me just click done. Click on the gear down in the lower left. Come into the audio settings to the split audio tab. And then for the input from the mixer, put a check mark in there. And that'll that'll split the stereo signal up into, I mean, well, it's not stereo in that case. It's actually balanced audio where one is phase inverted from the other. So it's sending basically two streams. Um, but what you can do is split it and then mute one of them. So you can see this one is not on and this one is on. So it'll essentially take each of the audio feeds from the balanced connection and convert them to mono. So you'll just be getting that one. I don't think that's probably the case, but you could try that and see if that makes a difference there, Song. So good question. Let me know if you, if you have more details you can share. By all means, send those over and happy to take a closer look at it. All right, Mark, I do all my filming, I'm film editing in DaVinci Resolve, but I want to mix the audio in a DAW, digital audio workstation, preferably Logic Pro 10, along with some RX9 processing before sending it back to Resolve. Is this possible because I haven't worked out the workflow for this yet? That's an interesting question, Mark. Um, and the reason I say that is that DaVinci Resolve has a DAW built into it called Fairlight. So um, what I typically do is if I'm using DaVinci Resolve, which I do every once in a while, sometimes, um, I use, I can, you can round trip to RX9 and, uh, you know, do any of the processing there. So then you don't have to go out to another digital audio workstation. So that's how I would generally approach it. I don't know if someone else who's more familiar with DaVinci Resolve knows how to get you know, a timeline out of Resolve into Logic Pro 10. I think you're probably going to need some conversion software. Um, sounds pretty complicated. I haven't tried it, so I don't have an answer for you. I apologize for that. But if someone in the chat does, and you're still committed to doing it in Logic as opposed to in Fairlight, I would actually encourage you to try it in Fairlight. Um, it's going to make things a lot easier for you. And that's really the, val the biggest value proposition to me of DaVinci Resolve is you have editing, color correction, compositing, uh, digital audio workstation, all in a single app, so you don't have to round trip. So there's some thoughts on that. If anyone has more insights for Mark that you can share in the chat, we would love that as well. So thanks for the question, Mark. All right, one last question from Chris N. I'm filming a road trip movie in a few months. There will be three actors in the vehicle. I was thinking of wiring them each with a tracky recorder in 32-bit float with Sank and Cost 11D lavalier mics. And I may also add a couple of shotguns, MKH-15416 connected to a Mix Pre-6 
and drop the bag in the car. I don't have gear for wireless transmission. Since I can't actively monitor sound for anomalies besides being extra careful to guard against friction against the mics, are there other things you might recommend? I think 32-bit float will be my friend in this use case. I agree. That's another great example of where 32-bit float can be really helpful. If you don't have the ability to monitor and adapt or adjust the settings, that could be a good use case. Also, it seems that audio gear hasn't escaped global supply chain issues. I can't find the additional trackies or Sankens anywhere right now. Gotham, Location Sound, B&H are all bone dry. Uh, yeah, True Audio, try them as well. But if the others are out, they're probably going to be out too. Um, yeah, so lots of lots of issues there. I think your plan sounds, sounds solid, um, and that's how I would probably approach it as well. Another thing too, I don't know how much they'll be moving within the vehicle, but I would plant those mics as opposed to putting them on the person. You know, obviously maybe you could plant the the 50 and the 416 and then um, I often plant lavs as well in cars. I think that works pretty decently. Um, so some things to consider there. If they're not going to be moving around a lot, like if they're going to be staying in their seats, unless you have some somebody in the back seat moving around a lot, <laughs> um, I would, you know, I would, I would try to get a bunch of plant mics and manage it that way. So that's that would be my general approach. All right, let's head on over to the chat and see what we got going in the chat today. Danny said I needed to wear my glasses during this so I could actually read the questions. <laughs> Here's from Chris, Christopher Rezzi is a resilient hardware encoder solution that does multiple output streams to the cloud to get additional bandwidth handle uplink features, competes with Teradek, LiveView, etc. Okay, thanks for that. So yeah, I would be monitoring at that if you can, Song. So that would be that would be a little better. And if you're getting something different when you're monitoring on the Resi versus what people are actually hearing on the stream, then we have a bigger issue to, to address. I don't know what that would be. Ted, thanks for the suggestion to try Hindenburg as a DAW for voice capture. It has several features that provide an optimized workflow. Real-time noise reduction is one. You bet. Very good, Ted. Glad that's working out well for you. It's always nice to find a tool that works well. Eric, love the time code more in the Mix Pre 2 than the 32-bit. I agree. <laughs> time code is, uh, yeah, it depends on what you're doing, but having that time code can be a bigger benefit but depending on again what you're doing versus the 32-bit float so that's a that's an interesting perspective remember these are all just tools and just consider what tools do you really need to get the job done well darren thanks so much for the super chat very much appreciated two-part question two-part question regarding voiceover animations currently using this using a steinberg ur 22c interface you need to get a recorder looking at the mix pre 32 and sentence portacaster okay I would prefer to record as best as possible, minimizing post-processing. I'd probably, um, I think your Baron, what was the, what was the interface again? Um, if you go back to that one, Steinberg, the Steinberg. Yeah, I would, unless you're having problems with that, I would probably go there. I like the Portcaster. Some people don't, the Portcaster takes a very different approach to a lot of modern recorders, field recorders or you know, miniature audio interfaces, it is very much uh, kind of an analog experience. It is, there are no menus, there's no screen. Um, it's all switches and dials and it works pretty nicely. I, I quite like it, so, uh, but there are other people that just don't like that approach. Um, yeah, I wouldn't, I mean, a, a mix pre could do a nice job at that as well. Um, if you're, if you're looking to avoid post-processing and you are willing to put in the time to learn and really dial in something like a compressor to record with so that you don't have as much post-processing work, then I think something like a DBX-286 is nice. We actually use that on, um, uh, for my day job, we do live streams and for the main host, we are now using a DBX-286S and that's worked really, really well for us so far. So, and it's really just a matter of dialing it in once. And as long as nobody comes and mucks around with the dials, <laughs> it's in good shape. And if so, I can help them set it back up again. So that's worked really well for us as well. So of those three, I would, I would probably just stick with the Steinberg unless there's something that you're finding it's not doing that you need it to do. 
All right, Mark, the Sennheiser 500 G4 supports line level input. Thank you for confirming that. I've, all, I've used this for a number of small jobs, including bridging audio to speaker amp for an indoor broadcast to an outdoor system. Perfect. There you go. There is confirmation that the 500 series supports line level input. So that could be a valid option there for you. All right. Latoria. Cubase Pro can import export video up to 32 bits, strictly audio processing. You can then take that audio and put it into your video editing software after the audio processing. Very good. Cubase is 32 bit float capable, it would appear. Thanks for that. All right, from Mark, thanks. Uh, but the MIDI control surfaces, surfaces for Fairlight are pretty awful. I use a Behringer X Touch with Logic Pro 10. Okay. No, fair point. I just didn't have that context. So yeah, that makes sense why you'd want to go to Logic Pro. By the way, I think they dropped the 10 um, now that they've moved the operating systems beyond 10. <laughs> so I think it's just Logic Pro at this point. But um, that makes sense. And I, I apologize. I don't know specifically how to get audio, you know, how to route a round trip from Resolve over to Final or to, yeah, to Logic Pro. Excuse me. Okay, this is an add-on to the Cubase comment. Add on to the Cubase comment, as a film composer, I will get the video footage with the original audio and I will master the audio out in 24-bit. Very good. And do you do any sort of uh, intentional dithering or do you just let Cubase handle that for you as a default setting? I'm curious. If Chris can't get the tracky, I'm seeing the Rode Wireless Go 2 all over the place, even at Guitar Center. Um, yeah, that doesn't have 32, that doesn't have the wide dynamic range capability, but it could do the recording. It's a body pack recorder. Maybe the Zoom F2 as an alternative would be one worth looking into. It seems like Zoom somehow, I don't know if Zoom is manufacturing their own silicon and it could be why they are able to, to keep up with demand or I don't know, but it seems like more of the Zoom products are still in stock. Thanks for that, Ono Coffee. And this was before... A note about the Wireless Go 2, when you update the firmware, it shuts off transmit auto record. You need to turn that on again in the app. Almost bit me on Friday. Yeah, good good catch there. Um, so the transmitting mode. Yeah, thanks for sharing. Okay, so this goes back to the 32-bit float discussion. Okay, more on 32-bit float. What monitors can reproduce that range? None that I'm aware of. I mean, it has more to do with the... It's going to have to do with the amplifiers as well. Um, see, this is all in di the digital domain, so that that's the thing. I don't think there's really such a thing, Archie. You still have to you you have to do you have to do some sort of dynamics control at some point. The question is, would you want to do it during recording or in post? I've had a MixPre three two for a year, and I still use twenty four bit unless I'm in a situation solo shooting where I can't monitor sound and it may get suddenly loud. For talking head, I found no practical use. That's my experience, too. Thanks for that, Jared and Rocky Rim Jam. Uh, Keith says, I've used 32-bit float mix pre-3.2 recording a very noisy construction site for sound library. Still set the game. Indeed. Uh, Harry, I'm lucky to own a mix pre-3 Mark one and a mix pre-6 Mark II. For most vocal situations, the 3 is great, but if I'm doing vocal at say an air show or drag racing i find the six is handy to have with a 32 bit yeah and then you can just do the compression in post okay here we or if go. you if you need to do compression back to cubase back to um, back to cubase okay, okay. <laughs> you do some intentional dithering okay very good just curious there all right phil sorry for the rookie question no never be sorry for the rookie questions we specifically Make these sound for video sessions so that you can ask the questions that you might be ridiculed for in some other places on the internet. We want this to be a safe place to ask those. So, but what is the point of changing gain in post? My thinking was that this was just about sensitivity on the way in. Is that not right? Well, Phil, in the example we showed over here in Audition, let me just undo everything here. Let's switch on over to the Mac. Okay, you have you had to change things in post. This is on you can't you can't go live with that. So you'd have to pull it down in post. And then likewise you have to boost this up. It's just so quiet that people wouldn't, you know, 
they wouldn't be able to hear it or they'd have to crank their volume to max to be able to hear it. And that's the 32-bit. So that's, that's what a 32-bit float can do, a float recording can do, is if you set it incorrectly during the recording, you then have this latitude in post to fix it, to address the, the issue that you've created. So hopefully that gives you a little more context to what we're talking about here. Okay. Uh, uh, wrap up. Wrap up question, Danny says. Question, bottom line, is 32-bit float a good tool for professional use? I would say, let's go ahead and switch back mm. to our main cam here. So I would say, Shoji, that's a great, great question. I would say that it is a tool in the toolbox. Is it the tool that you will always use? I think it really, that you always should use. It depends on what you're doing. In my toolbox, it is a nice tool to have, but it's one that gets pulled out very infrequently for the type of work that I work on. So that's my perspective on that. Um, if you're recording at air shows, that totally makes sense where, where it's probably a better choice, a better tool for those particular situations. Are you recording super dynamic sound effects recordings? Probably makes sense in those situations, yes. But it's not the only tool in the toolbox and it's not, it shouldn't be from my point of view, the only tool ever used. Okay, we have two things oh. that go up with that. <laughs> uh, two that go along with that. I rented a Mix Pre 62 for an air show, and as a novice, 32 plo 32 bit float definitely saved me. Completely agree. Good tool for that situation. Bit depth is only important in the digital realm for processing. Um. Well. I think we demonstrated here that 32-bit float can make a difference in these certain circumstances. So I think there's value in it there as well. Of course, once you get into post, having that additional bit depth, I mean, you have to have a, a wide enough container to store the dynamic range in. Um, so it does matter during recording as well from that standpoint. Um, but yes, definitely once you get into post and you're starting to process, that's where it really comes in handy as well. So, all right. Thanks everybody for joining us for our sound for video session. I'm gonna cue a couple things up here, get a little better. I'm operating the mixer on this computer <laughs> and playing the music back. So I wanna get everything queued up. Oh wait, we have something else. Danny has something else for us. Oh, Keith, thanks so much for the super chat. Very much appreciated, thank you. All right, everybody, get out there. Have a great day. Make some great sound this week. We'll talk to you next week.